Thank you so much, Ken. Uh, it, it's really my pleasure to be here, and uh, it, it's really an honor to see uh, this large group in attendance. And uh, I hope you'll find uh, the discussion interesting. Uh, and, and I'm really glad that it was a big group because we got to move to the chemistry building. And I've never given a lecture uh, in the chemistry building before uh, in front of the, the periodic table of the elements. Uh, and I want to point out uh, number 97 up there, Berkelium, uh, which has something to do with Berkeley, I think. Uh, <laughs> so anyway, uh, tonight I want to talk about uh, performance-based uh, seismic design or earthquake-resistant design of tall buildings. And uh, what I really want to focus on is um, how are we designing the buildings uh, in San Francisco and Los Angeles, uh, San Diego, Seattle, and so forth. Um, from from a, a first-hand perspective, being involved with many of the projects there, I, I, I'm sure, uh, and I know there's many tall buildings going up uh, in Auckland, uh, impressive ones. And I, I'd love to hear how the designs are going there, but I don't know, so I can't speak to those. Uh, you know, this photograph here, uh, is uh, one of the uh, pictures of the skyline of San Francisco. And that skyline has really changed in the last decade because of uh, the large number of very tall buildings that has gone up. Uh, you, you can't even imagine from what's shown here what has happened, but you know, one of the most iconic buildings now is this one in the center that towers above all the other adjacent buildings. And there's a few other buildings that are uh, catching up but I think it'll remain the tallest building uh, in San Francisco for some time to come. And a little bit of what I'll talk about will we'll focus uh, directly on the design for that building because I think it's interesting. Uh, the, the change of the uh, skyline in San Francisco has caught the attention of lots of people, uh, the local newspapers, the national newspapers. Uh, even the New York Times uh, has had a couple articles uh, about the tall building surge in San Francisco. Uh, one of them entitled uh, San Francisco's Big Gamble. And uh, it's interesting, you know, when, when you find uh, that earthquake engineering and structural engineering is, is in the headlines. Uh, I'm not sure that uh, San Francisco's Big Gamble uh, was the headline I was hoping for. Uh, but I don't think it's such a big gamble, and, and I hope we'll see uh, as we go forward a little bit with uh, some of the presentation, uh, that things are being done in a fairly logical uh, way. Uh, to start out, though, I wanted to plot up uh, the, the growth of tall buildings in California. So this is a plot showing the highest building in California in meters uh, as a function of the year. So each building uh, is shown by a circle. And if there's a circle, it means it became temporarily the tallest building in California for that period. And we start out with the, uh, the Chronicle building over here from about uh, 1890. That building survived the, the San Francisco earthquake. Uh, it's become the facade of another taller building now. So it still exists uh, in some form. Uh, the next building shown across is the Standard Oil Building, still in operation today in San Francisco. Um, LA City Hall is the third building. Has anyone ever seen that building before? I, I first saw this building growing up in the Midwest watching television. Uh, it's the building that Superman uh, could leap over in one <laughs> single bound. Uh, so a very famous building uh, for that uh, purpose and others. Uh, the Transamerica Tower, an iconic building in San Francisco. Uh, when first constructed, uh, it was not so favorably seen by many uh, of the San Franciscans. It was kind of an oddball looking building. But uh, they came to love it over the years. Uh, the next thing in Los Angeles is um, the U.S. Bank Tower. Uh, I only know that building because I was deposed in there once uh, related to some earthquake damage. And I'll never forget. And then the two buildings that are at the far right, uh, Wilshire Grand in Los Angeles and uh, the Transbay Tower or Salesforce Tower in San Francisco. And uh, the one on the left uh, is claimed to be the tallest building on the West Coast, uh, but only because it has the spire that reaches way, way up into the sky. 
And uh, the Salesforce Tower in San Francisco is really taller. So uh, don't let the statistics uh, fool you there. Now, today we have tremendous power in computing, uh, tremendous knowledge uh, in the response of structural components that helps us design our buildings. We'll show some of that. Uh, if you go back, though, into like the 1930s and so forth, the designs uh, were really based on very, very simple hand calculation kinds uh, of methods. And I wanted to uh, bring out uh, an old book that, that sits in my shelves at home uh, by Hardy Cross on continuous frames of reinforced concrete. And that, that's uh, Professor Cross from the University of Illinois. And uh, he invented, devised this method known as moment distribution. How many of you have been taught the moment distribution method? Quite a few. I'm not sure whether in uh, the classes today the, the young students are getting that method. A very powerful tool, very powerful way of thinking. You know, the idea and figure at the top, you've got a, a beam that's statically indeterminate. Uh, you fix some degrees of freedom, apply the load, calculate some fixed end moments. Uh, there's an unbalanced set of moments here. You apply those as an unbalanced, or as to balance the moment, you apply that in the next step. Uh, you use uh, the principle of linear superposition to add the solutions together, and you, you get the answer. And this became, and was for 30, 40 years, the, the most powerful analysis tool that we had at hand. So Hardy Cross really had a lot to do with uh, being able to analyze buildings back in the 30s. He also had some other funny things that he wrote. Um, this is another book uh, that collects some of his writings from the 1950s, and the writings go back into the 40s. Uh, he wrote about standardization, uh, and what he wrote is, is peculiar. It says, uh, as the size and complexity of projects increased, it became desirable and even necessary to set up a series of routine procedures for analysis and design. Good? With these standardized formulas and specifications and methods, it became possible to use a greater number of men, uh, sorry, uh, women, uh, and, and men with less training uh, to produce engineering work. Bear in mind, this was written in the 1940s. Uh, and by and large, it was men at the time. It, and it's great to see that changing. And then his last sentence is very odd. Standardization as a check on fools and rascals or set up as an intellectual assembly line has served well in the engineering world. Think about that one for a moment. Uh, it, it really doesn't uh, portray us very well in structural engineering, does it? Uh, first, there's the fools and the rascals, which is fun to, to quote. But the notion of an intellectual assembly line uh, where engineers uh, with less training can produce engineering works efficiently and safely. It doesn't sound right, but you know, this was the thinking at the time. And standardization in our codes has helped us achieve this. You know, build safe buildings uh, safely with, without the highest levels of training that uh, might be possible. Now, that works really well, of course, because it gets applied mainly to the majority of buildings that we construct. And in the United States, the majority of those buildings uh, are buildings one to three stories, 93% according to this tally. Uh, if we go four to 13 stories, uh, we pick up the next 6%. Uh, the last 1%, the ones that we find really sexy and appealing, uh, uh, it's a very small segment of what we build. And of course, the standardized codes really aren't written for those buildings. Uh, you can't have an assembly line of engineers who are not so well trained designing them by reading a book. It takes something more. And that something more is, is where I'd like to focus my, my talk tonight. Uh, but don't forget Hardy Cross, a very interesting fellow. We can tell stories about him all night long if we wanted to. Uh, these tall buildings have different dynamic behaviors than short buildings. This is a, a model of a 42-story building. Watch what happens. This is the displacement. These are the story shears. It reminds me of my grandfather's handheld drill, which, which is not a good image. Uh, but you know, look at the, how the shear forces 
wiggles back and forth. This structure is driven in shear forces by the second mode response, second translational mode of response. And uh, a standardized code procedure is not going to understand how that works really well and it's not going to do a wonderful job uh, in setting the design requirements. Uh, what's going on down right at this level here? Well, that's the transfer level where, where the tower comes down and, and enters into subterranean levels and that's where the reaction force is, the joint of the building so to speak is, and so you get those big reverse shears. So you need different procedures for the design of these kinds of buildings. Uh, these kinds of buildings are also specialized in that the framing systems are different from what the building code <coughs> prescribes, at least in the United States. In the United States, if you're going to build a tall building uh, over uh, 150, 180 feet, how many meters is that, 60 meters, uh, if you're going to design a building over that height and it's going to have a concrete wall for seismic resistance, it must also have a frame to go with it. Now, the frame is there kind of as a backup uh, system to provide a little bit more redundancy, a little bit more uh, confidence that the system's going to work. Uh, but engineers began to challenge whether that extra frame is really necessary, especially if you're doing a good analysis and good design and good detailing. And uh, also that frame got in the way of the occupants of residential buildings uh, having wonderful views of San Francisco. And you do get wonderful views of this city from uh, these buildings. And so they began to explore the idea of taking away some of the framing and putting up structural systems that aren't in or are not permitted by the current building codes. And so that's another reason why uh, you need some specialized procedures. Uh, Going back to about, uh, I guess about 13, 14 years ago or so, in San Francisco was the start of designing these kinds of buildings completely outside of the code prescription. And for a while it was the wild, wild west. Uh, uh, if you're familiar with the cowboy shows from the 60s and 70s, as I am. Uh, engineers uh, on one side of the street were doing something completely opposite of what the engineers were doing on the other side of the street. And you know, one review panel would, would say, you, you're not allowed to do this. And the other panel for almost an identical building would say, you must do this. And it was confusing and difficult for the engineers and for the city uh, to review these things. And so we set out uh, to organize practicing engineers and researchers to, to come up with some guidance and some consensus on how to design these buildings. So the Tall Buildings Initiative was started. Some guidelines were written to uh, get us uh, at least some uh, organization, some uh, um, usual uh, design methods in place that would be repeated over and over again. And, and the engineer didn't feel as if he or she was uh, sticking him or herself way, way out uh, off the limb of the branch, so to speak. More recently, uh, the ACI building code, uh, ACI 318-19, uh, is just going through the final stages of being completed. It should be out in June of this year. It has an appendix uh, that has the title uh, Design Verification Using Nonlinear Response History Analysis. So this is a set of building code provisions for reinforced concrete construction. Uh, put together by the ACI building code, the 40 members of that committee, uh, to be compatible with this document. So that, uh, in a sense, the experts in reinforced concrete are taking ownership of this procedure so that uh, standardized methods going forward for concrete will be in the concrete code. And uh, the American Institute of uh, Steel Construction is uh, working on a companion document for steel buildings. Okay, so that's the direction the US is, is headed currently. Uh, these uh, alternative design methods up till now have been permitted uh, by some clauses in our building codes. Uh, and you, know, you can read the purpose statement, you know, wh why did we go about uh, developing these guidelines and so forth? Well, it's to enable the design of tall buildings uh, by alternative methods uh, and design, it doesn't say so, but by design, I think, in a better way uh, than the hardy cross code methods would permit. But your idea from the building code is that uh, the building official shall permit 
the design of buildings that use alternative methods or materials or ways of designing. Uh, if it's demonstrated that uh, the structural design as developed is not less in performance uh, than buildings designed by the provisions of the code. So that's the escape clause that's allowed the design of these buildings to move forward. And it's important to note, it doesn't say that are better than uh, performance of buildings designed by this code. It says not less than. And by and large, the design of these uh, taller buildings is targeted at a performance level uh, that's not less than the minimum permitted by the building code. It's not something special, usually. Uh, the risk categories as we define them uh, in the US codes, uh, you know, we get uh, risk category one. Uh, these are like barns. This is, this is where your sheep live. Uh, so that doesn't require such important design. Buildings uh, number three, if you've got a very large economic impact or many occupants, might be a risk category three. Uh, four is an essential facility. Most of the tall buildings are residential or they're office buildings that aren't so big. They fall into risk category two. And that's what most of the owners are targeting. One can, however, with these design procedures, uh, determine that your building is important because uh, there's a lot of people living in it or the building's iconic or the building threatens the surrounding neighborhood because it's so tall. And so it's possible to up uh, the risk category and design for something better, but it's pretty rare. And that's not my decision. That's just the way it, the way it is uh, in the design practice and the building practice. When we design by Hardy Cross's prescriptive methods, uh, we always uh, design for what we call the design earthquake in California. And so the design earthquake is two thirds more or less of something we call a maximum considered earthquake. Uh, and we design at that level and that should provide enough strength that the building will be serviceable under some undefined earthquake and it should have some reserve against collapse in some big earthquake. Uh, but uh, even though that's been the intent, we've never designed buildings for that until very recently. And what we're usually doing today is we're setting aside the design earthquake completely. And we're designing the structure to be stable under MCE level of shaking and to be serviceable uh, under some shaking that's got a 50% probability of exceedance in 30 years. Uh, and that 50 pro percent probability of exceedance in 30 years is defined by a response spectrum at not 5% damping, but 2.5% or less, depending on the building height. Because these tall buildings tend to have lower effective damping and energy dissipation. Uh, some designers still start the design process by looking at the design earthquake. They're used to doing it. It gives them some proportions that they can lay out the shear walls and the other framing and get started, and then they set the results aside. Some cities, like San Francisco, uh, do require that the engineer actually do the design earthquake check, but they can change the R factor. So de facto, they're saying, yeah, do the design check, but you don't have to follow all the rules that are in uh, the code. So it's, it's a nominal check uh, in most cases. Uh, in terms of seismic hazard analysis, I'm no expert at it, so I'm not going to spend much time. But it's worthwhile seeing what we do in terms of selecting ground motions and so forth. Uh, here on the right is uh, an elevation of that uh, Salesforce tower uh, next to the Transbay Transit Center. All of these things have been in the news lately. Uh, and uh, there is UC Berkeley, by the way. For any students who are interested, uh, that's where UC Berkeley is. Uh, we have a very exciting location. Uh, the Hayward Fault goes through our football stadium, and we're waiting, and it, and it slips gradually with time, and so we, we get to see how much it moves every year. Uh, but we're waiting. It's overdue. Uh, across the bay, uh, the San Andreas Fault is there, the very famous one. And you know, this building is located about there. Okay, so it's a very active uh, environment, a very complicated environment. And engineering seismologists are always brought in uh, to do a site-specific hazard analysis to assess you know, what is the hazard level at this site. 
and generally it gets put together in terms of uh, uniform hazard spectrum. And uniform hazard spectrum means that the, the hazard or the risk is uniform at every period around the length of the, the range of the uh, period zones. And so uh, this is the same probability of exceedance there at that period as it is way over there. Now, no one earthquake can cause all the spectral ordinance to be that high. This is made up of the contributions of many different rare shaking uh, events. And what's become very common in the design of these buildings is to identify predominant vibration periods uh, for the structural system. Uh, you hope that you can find uh, some predominant first mode periods and some second or third modes where all the periods kind of line up. And then to uh, define what's referred to as uh, conditional mean spectra. And the essence of this is if you are at period one, uh, you would like your response spectral ordinates that you're going to design for to be at the peak for this hazard level. But if you have a ground motion that gives you that peak, as you move to shorter periods or longer periods, the probability of also being way up at the uniform hazard levels is small. And so what's done is to define what's the expected spectral ordinates as you move away. And you can see the blue curve dropping off here. By the way, that's a log-log plot, as seismologists like to use. So it drops way off. Uh, and the, the expectation is that by doing this, there may be some economy in the structural design. I'm not convinced that that's the case. We're doing some research now looking into this. You know, if you have a response that's dominated by period T2, then what's going on at T1 doesn't really matter. So the fact that you have reduced the ordinates related to that with this uh, green curve here may not really help you so much. But sometimes it helps a little. Uh, mainly what I think it's doing is it's helping to keep the engineering seismologists employed because they have <laughs> twice as many ground motions to select now with that. Uh, in any case, we do not permit the response spectral ordinates to drop anywhere below 75% of what the uniform hazard spectrum is. So we, we make sure that this game playing doesn't result in ordinates that are too low. Uh, the engineering seismologist knows what parts of the uh, seismic environment contributed to the most to that seismic hazard. So here we're looking at 43-year return period service level and 2475, maybe MCE. Uh, and you can find there's different uh, distances and magnitudes that contribute most to the hazard at those different uh, return periods and at this spectral period of four seconds. And so that helps the engineering seismologist to pick out ground motion records uh, to use uh, to test the building. Uh, so that's a fundamental piece of information that comes out of this. I hope no one can read this slide. It's intentionally too busy. Uh, but uh, in essence, what's being done today is to go into the uh, next generation attenuation relation uh, uh, ground motion database and to pull out from that database all the records that might be relevant uh, for testing this building. And so you can see maybe in the, uh, the broken line in red, there might be a series of records that represent the local event at a certain distance. And maybe there's a few records in the upper right that represent the huge earthquake at a greater distance. Uh, and so then the next thing to do is to narrow down uh, which of the earthquakes require large scaling. And if you require a scaling factor that's too big, you throw those out. Uh, which ones have the right duration associated with them? You, you can't use earthquake ground motion records to, that are four seconds long to test a building that's got a vibration period of eight seconds. And so uh, we look also at what records have the right frequency content in terms of impulsive motions. So if you're near an active fault, there's a certain percentage of motions you'd expect to have an impulse, and you'd expect that to be distributed around your target period and so forth. And uh, that's as much as I know. This is an engineering seismology field. But records are selected 
they're scaled, uh, the frequency content might be adjusted such that the scaled record fits a little bit better. Uh, these days, it's unusual to match the ground motion spectrum exactly to the target, uh, but to have a rougher match associated with it. And uh, typical sets of motions look something like this. So we start out with an acceleration history, and then it gets scaled, uh, and then there's the frequency content is adjusted, and so we look at uh, the acceleration histories, the velocity histories, the displacement histories, how the energy builds up uh, for areas intensity. Uh, we, we pull out what the velocity pulses look like, so we make sure that when the record is scaled and adjusted, we're not turning it into something unnatural. Uh, and, and I always read these reports and enjoy reading them, and I, I don't really know what to make of them. Uh, but I learn a little bit more each time. Uh, but there's a great deal of care taken to select a set of motions that's representative and realistic. We only look at horizontal pairs of ground motions. We don't ever use vertical motion. Why not? No one's demonstrated its importance yet. Uh, we're working on studying that. Uh, and we tend to use just 11 earthquake ground motions at any one period that we're looking at. So if we have a two conditional uh, response spectra, uh, we would have 22 pairs of earthquake ground motions that we use for the test. Why 22? Two times 11, why 11? Well, you get a certain probability that you're going to be within 20% of your expected result when you use those records. Okay, the, the bigger the sample, the more likely you're going to get something close to the mean. All right, the buildings are of several types, but most of the buildings going up have a core, a reinforced concrete core, uh, and some of them have steel framing for gravity framing around them. Uh, most of them have unbonded, post-tensioned, cast-in-place floors that are used for the gravity framing. And I, I bring this to your attention. Uh, we, we don't have any uh, hollow core, Charles. Uh, and uh, we uh, usually have uh, reinforced concrete framing. And even though we normally wouldn't include that as part of our seismic resistance, when we use these procedures, we model the resistance of all the parts of the building, including the gravity framing. So the typical structural model ends up looking something like on the left. Uh, the core wall is, is uh, typically put together with fiber uh, elements. Uh, we generally would have the slab to column framing represented with some approximations with some outrigger beam column elements. Uh, at the diaphragms, uh, the transfer level diaphragms where the, the core and the tower goes into the basement, there's a tremendous force transfer. And how that force transfers out or in in the building depends tremendously on how you model the stiffness. And so that stiffness is very carefully modeled. We don't know how to model it, so we have bounding analyses that are required. You have to uh, use twice what you think the stiffness might be and maybe half of what you think it might be and take the worst answer. And then uh, the elements that are expected to respond nonlinearly in most of these buildings, concrete coupling beams or composite coupling beams, uh, the nonlinear model represents strength and stiffness degradation uh, directly. And so that's, that's part of the entire procedure. And these things are pretty well calibrated to lab tests. We hope what goes on in the building is like what's in the laboratory. Uh, we're waiting for our earthquake to tell us. And I guess that is San Francisco's big gamble. Uh, at levels where... Uh, the tower changes into more of a, a, a podium structure. There are force transfers. Those levels have to be modeled uh, in terms of their flexibility, and they have to be explored. And levels above and below that have to be modeled also because the, how the forces transfer in and out depends on the local modeling. Um, if we have different kinds of walls, uh, like this tower wall on a mat and a, a blade wall on a spread footing, then we model the soil uh, foundation structure flexibility so we can tell how the forces transfer. Otherwise, a rigid base model is the norm. Uh, the acceptance criteria. Uh, 
they go on for pages, of course, in the document, but it's boring to read those things. But to illustrate, you know, we look at for uh, this service level shaking, usually it's done with a linear elastic model, modal response spectrum analysis. Uh, we check that story drift ratios are not more than 0.005. Looks like total drift. We're talking story drift, though. Uh, we make sure that coupling beams and wall elements that might yield uh, in the maximum considered earthquake shaking, make sure that they stay effectively in the linear elastic range. A little bit of overstress is permitted if it's a ductile element. That's the essence of the service level check. When we get to MCE, uh, this is the slide that could take the rest of the period, but we'll try not to do it. Uh, we select earthquake ground motions to represent the hazard. We build the nonlinear model. Uh, the mean of the transient story drifts that you get out of their 11 uh, ground motions is not to exceed 3%. Uh, the residual uh, story drift is supposed to be less than 1%. You know, we don't want these tall buildings to be leaning in such a way that uh, a city would close down the adjacent neighborhoods. Uh, deformation controlled elements are generally allowed to rotate as far as the computer software will, will let them go, as long as the building stays stable. Uh, many engineers restrict the rotations, though, to be uh, about 6%, uh, such that it's pretty assured that you're not losing strength uh, through cyclic loading in the element. Uh, strains are modeled. I don't believe the strain value is calculated, but fortunately, they're all really small. And that's a good thing. Uh, and then when we calculate things like shear in a shear wall, we call that a, it's a, it's a behavior for which we don't want inelastic response. We call it force controlled. And those kinds of elements have to satisfy this load combination. So there's a dead load effect. So we've got you know, dead plus some make-believe vertical component. Uh, you've got live load. Uh, you have your transient earthquake shear minus any shear that was associated with gravity load, but for a shear wall, it's zero, uh, times 1.3. Uh, the 1.3 is intended to give us that 10% risk of damage that might uh, lead to collapse uh, that's in the risk category for category two building. Uh, and if you get into a category three, then this I sub E factor kicks in and you, you have to go more standard deviations above the mean. Uh, that has to be less than a, a strength reduction factor, which comes out of the ACI building code. Uh, a nominal strength, which comes out of our ACI building code. And then a factor that's been made up to reflect the fact that for some kinds of behaviors, the building code is conservative in representing what the strength is. And here's an example, wall shear strength. Uh, we know that the shear strength degrades and drops down to some lower value as the ductility demand goes up, and typical of many kinds of concrete elements. Uh, most of these core wall buildings have very, very low ductility demands. So it's permissible to take that overstrength into account through that B factor uh, when you're doing the design. And it's routinely done these days. Uh, and that's now been adopted into the ACI building code, uh, Appendix A, uh, without touching it. I was surprised. Uh, there are other things that you could check, but that we don't normally require as part of the design. You could check non-structural components using the accelerations that you get uh, from your nonlinear analysis. Most engineers just use the building code requirements for tying things down. Um, you could worry about your neighbors. For example, this tall building is sitting right next to the Bay Bridge. Uh, you could spit from the fourth or fifth floor and hit the bridge. It's really close. Uh, and so uh, you know, we want to be sure, and we include in the guidelines, that the cladding doesn't come off. Right? You, you want your cladding to hang on the building like the scales on a fish. When it moves, you don't want the scales coming off of the thing. Uh, and then the transient drift and the residual drift have to be controlled more so than conventional buildings. Uh, for intermediate shaking, you could consider a repairability limit state, but it's not being done today. 
uh, Ken uh, and others are, held a workshop on repairability. That's where you plug into this methodology. Uh, and then there's the design. And a lot of attention goes into designing these things. Here's a core wall. I'll give you a second to, to catch your breath. Uh, these are big construction workers, by the way. Uh, those are designed and detailed very carefully and inspected pretty carefully, too. Transfer forces are very carefully monitored through the review because most practicing engineers are not really good at understanding how diaphragms work uh, in the US and maybe not in other places, too. Uh, and getting this transfer force taken care of properly is critically important for these buildings. Uh, this collector in a tall building in Los Angeles had, if you were to take all the steel in the collector and put it into a square, it would be 0.4 meters by 0.4 meters uh, grade 400 steel. Okay, so huge forces getting dragged around in these buildings. Uh, design of foundations. I still teach my undergraduates that you make the foundation thick enough so you don't have to put shear reinforcement in it. Uh, I tell my uh, engineers that I'm peer reviewing, you put shear reinforcement in there because we know that there is a size effect uh, that the unit shear strength drops down to about 40% uh, or so of what the strength is from a thin element if you have no shear reinforcement. And so these things are all being built, and they have been for the last 15 years with shear reinforcement. And I'm proud of that one. Uh, and then the gravity framing uh, is typically unbonded post-tension uh, construction. And the typical design puts in uh, what we call uh, stud rails. So there's shear reinforcement around all these connections. I remember uh, Professor Park uh, doing tests, not quite on stud rails, but doing tests on slab column connections and looking at shear reinforcement and so on. So it's done routinely in these buildings because even though you don't rely on these for seismic resistance, you can't afford to fix them all. And if you don't do this, those are the elements that we calculate are damaged and uh, cost the most to repair. And then there is design and design review. You need a savvy owner who talks to a building official, and the building official has to permit this kind of a process. The design team has to know how to do it. And I know there's many engineers in New Zealand who would know how to do this. And then you need a review panel that's willing to judge uh, whether or not uh, the engineers are singing a good tune or they're not singing a good tune. Uh, do you know these people in New Zealand? <laughs> I hope so. Anyway, they're from like America's Got Talent or something. <laughs> but that's where I sit usually. Um, so here's a model of the Salesforce Tower under one of the earthquake ground motions. And by the way, I have to thank Ron Klementchik from MKA who provides a lot of this material. But you can see how the higher modes are driving this building initially. And Eventually, as the ground settles down, the building settles into a simpler sway mode. It's pre predominantly first mode. And this is not the scale, although uh, the movement is uh, over three meters in a building like this up at the top. And you really try to avoid having buildings that twist, because if you've got somebody up in a tall building and the building's twisting, uh, they're not going to be feeling so well. Uh, Performance verification in a typical tower. Here's from the Salesforce building. Here's where we would limit the shear stress. We know we can deliver that much shear strength in these buildings easily considering the, the demands are, for flexural ductility are really low. And they check out pretty well. But these checks are routine as what we do. We check uh, core wall calculated longitudinal strains. Again, I don't really believe them so much, but Look, here's 0.003, which I think is a fairly reliable compressive strain capacity without any special confinement. These walls never get close to it. And so it's pretty unusual to drive the walls hard in compression. And that makes me feel good. Uh, tensile strains, usually you get up to yield, but not too far beyond that. This building, look, up at the top, where they have the setback, is a problem area. Uh, 
And so the engineers have to put additional confinement up there. And they know that because they're doing this kind of analysis. Hardy Cross's codes wouldn't tell them. Uh, they look at the foundation demands uh, by uh, defining mean values in uh, the two orthogonal directions, create an envelope, factor those up as required for the fourth checks, and uh, then check that all the orbits of all their demands really do fall within uh, what they're designing for. And check bearing stresses and so forth. In case there's a geotechnical engineer in the, office, uh, in, in the room, we check those things too. Uh, what do we learn from all this? Well, we learned what uh, you in New Zealand have known for a long time, and we've, we read your papers and we know it too. We've never been able to get our building codes to recognize it until this year. Uh, that the shear forces that you get in the core walls is much greater than the forces that you calculate from the linear analysis by a factor of two and a half. And we've known it, but we, until the 2019 ACI code, we were unable to get this in. Uh, the design of these tall buildings, I think, pushed the code writers over the edge finally because everybody knew it was, it was an open secret. So that's one of the things that, that happened. Um, here's a sampling of buildings projects I've worked on. What kind of storage risk do we typically get? They're typically well within the limits. So in terms of service load behavior, likely to be pretty good. Uh, at MCE loading, we're pushing close to the 3% limit on some of these buildings. Uh, but again, bear in mind the shear stresses are within limits. The strain demands are pretty low. Uh, they're drifting this far because they're so tall. Um, residual story drifts, pretty low. Do we believe we can calculate these accurately? No. But again, at least we consistently find uh, the numbers are low and there's reasons for it the inelastic response demands are pretty low. Um, wall tensile strains, always low, not worried about fracturing. Um, compressive strains, there they are, barely need any confining steel, but we put all that steel in anyway, just in case we don't know what we're doing. Uh, wall shears are always right up at that limit, always right there. That's what controls these buildings. Uh, coupling beam rotations. They get close to this limit of 06, which is where we start seeing strength degradation in diagonally reinforced beams. And this is what they'll look like, I think, based on lab tests. Uh, in this MCE loading, they will be damaged. There'll be cracks to fix up. Um, will the building have to be replaced? Time will tell. We haven't looked at that. Great subject for Ken working on his repairability topics. Uh, let's see, going the wrong way here. Okay. Uh, so this sort of gets me just to a, a comment about the resilient city. And you know, I've had an interest for over a decade in this resilience topic, and I'm not going to go deep into this today because I don't have the numbers uh, to tell you about. Uh, but San Francisco is very interested in uh, being more resilient than it currently is. And uh, there's been talk about a resilient city for some you know, 10 years now. In fact, at a New Zealand earthquake concrete, conference in Christchurch. I, I gave a paper on this uh, in 2009. And you know, there's thoughts, well, you know, where are our buildings uh, in terms of their restoration times, uh, given what we currently have for the inventory of our buildings? Not very good. You know, we're talking about months and months and months to get people back in their homes and in their businesses. We'd like to get back here something closer to the left. And uh, that requires us to design new buildings to be, especially these tall towers, to be really resilient. So that on average, uh, when you take the existing inventory in the newer buildings, we'll have something that is, gives us some places that people can uh, stay and be housed. Uh, and if people can stay and be housed in a city, you know, then I think this, the city's got a chance to survive and recover uh, from the earthquake. And I think that the, the numbers we're getting uh, from these design procedures and the calculations are suggesting that, that we're on track with these tall buildings. Uh, but you don't know what you don't know, right? Uh, I think we all learned that in, in strong earthquakes. And we're way overdue in California for strong earthquakes. And I wish we'd have that earthquake 
before we built too many more of these things, but uh, this is the way it goes. Um, I'm uh, always impressed to see one of these buildings go up. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm an academic, but, but I really am interested in the practice of engineering and earthquake engineering, and I, I enjoy seeing a building go up. So let's take a look at what one of these looks like. So we start down at the ground. By the way, those of you who are debating, young students debating going to Stanford versus Berkeley, uh, that's a Stanford engineer. <laughs> we don't know whether we, he got out of there or not. Uh, but the, the tower comes up to the, the, the transfer level, uh, first floor, so there's the bars coming through. And uh, yeah, at this time of this building, lap splices were permitted at this location, but they're heavily confined. Uh, the next code, there's going to be restrictions in the U.S. on where those go. And then here's that picture again, in case you didn't uh, get a picture of it with your phones, um, of that core wall going up. And this is typical of how they look uh, as they go up. And then let's take a look at a building from farther away, and month by month, look at how the construction goes on the typical tall building. So there's a core, starts up, and goes up. And look how tall it's getting. And right about now, it begins to feel like, oh my gosh, Let's get the rest of the building up there so that it can support this very slender, skinny tower. It's not how it works. The tower is supporting the rest of the building, right? <laughs> so uh, this is the building at its best. Uh, but it's usual to slip form these uh, towers so that you get one uh, crew working on one thing and then the other crews start following. So you get multiple crews working on different floors at the same time. So the flooring starts up, the tower's going taller, July, August, September, they're starting to put the cladding up on the outside, the scales on that fish. November, December, January, February, and March, and there it is. You know, so that's how it goes up over the span of a year to a year and a half. Uh, the design and review process might take a year. Uh, and most engineers promise the owner, oh, it's six to nine months, but sometimes it takes longer because these reviews are done very seriously. These, these are serious buildings. Uh, and, and I like the idea of these buildings, uh, not because I want to build on everything, everywhere, and have buildings and buildings and buildings, but uh, you know, I think these are centers uh, in our cities where uh, people can live and have fun. Uh, they don't have to drive from the suburbs uh, or drive back to the suburbs after work. They can stay and live in a good environment uh, close to where the action is uh, and enjoy life and, and not be stuck in the traffic, some of which I was surprised to see also here in Auckland <laughs> in the last few days. Uh, and here's just some pictures of some of the projects uh, for which I was showing data, those data points were these various projects. And you know, they're Seattle, San Francisco, Los Angeles, Long Beach, uh, and San Diego is where most of them go. But I've, I've looked at uh, in detail all these buildings and, and several more. Uh, so uh, here I conclude the presentation. This is how it's being done right now uh, in uh, California and up and down the West Coast. Uh, looking at designing tall buildings um, in a way where we're, we're doing our best to understand the mechanics, doing our best to make sure that uh, the structures that are being built uh, even though they're, we're calling them risk category two, they're designed well within the limits, so I think that they'll help us have a resilient uh, community after the next earthquake. Uh, but uh, rather than leave you on that very, very positive note, uh, the next earthquake will tell us uh, whether we're actually doing it right. Thank you. You want to call on folks? Yeah, sure. Fair. I'll kick it off, Jack. Do you routinely ever look at what happens when the building's 50 years old and the concrete's strong and stiffer? Uh, we don't routinely do that. Um, you know, part of the design assumes that the, uh, the concrete is stronger and stiffer than uh, the specified strength. So there's usually a 30% bump to put on the specified strength with the expectation that within, within the year you're going to get close to that. Um, 
probably not a, a lot of extra strength gain beyond that, but there may be some. Uh, we uh, are implementing in the code the uh, minimum uh, boundary element uh, reinforcement, uh, thanks to some efforts uh, from Ken and Rick in, in our ACI code development to put in minimum longitudinal steel to make sure that we've got enough strength there so that uh, th there is strength beyond just the cracking strength of these buildings. But beyond that 1.3 factor, we don't have an extra bump to look like what's, what's going to happen 50 years down the road. Good point, though. Yes, yes, so the, in, in the, the two tallest buildings I showed, uh, the, these two on the right, the wind design uh, did control at least in the one direction. Uh, and certainly, you know, this one's got a pretty broad face to it. And so they're, they're, the moment strength ends up being controlled by that. And, and so there, there has to be sufficient strength put in for that. Uh, and you know, that's one of the reasons why in some of these you find the strain demands are so low because uh, the wind demands really are, are what's controlling them. Uh, there is a push these days to think about uh, allowing some yielding uh, under wind loading. You know, wh why should we have to have perfectly elastic response in, in a complex structure like this? You know, sure, I, I have a, a water tower on a stick. I don't want that thing to yield under wind loading. But in structures like this, uh, some modest amount of yielding might be acceptable. And, and there's some explorations in the laboratory and in design now to look into that for these really tall buildings. How many stories are there? These ones? Yeah. Uh, these are, uh, uh, they add up to like 60 stories. Uh, the, the one on this one is 60. I, this one might be a, a few extra stories. Um, but the total height is, I think, like 350 meters. Could you elaborate uh, what the performance base includes compared with the uh, cost? Yeah, so the great question. How can we quantify the, uh, the improvement in performance of these buildings uh, compared to the, the prescriptive code base? And there are a couple ways to answer that. One is, you know, the, the easy answer to that is, well, uh, these buildings are being designed under their natural behavior characteristics, under what we think are the right ground motions. Uh, so we're able to see in the response some response characteristics that would be missed. You know, like, like in this, this tower here has the setback in the wall up at the top, and we see that there is a weakness there that causes localized yielding. So, so just from a, the, the simple observation that we're, we think we're getting the right mechanisms that the prescriptive code would miss, uh, we're doing that. There were studies at the outset of uh, the Tall Buildings Initiative program where we designed a series of uh, about 50 story tall uh, core wall only buildings and core walls with frames and then a buckling restrained uh, braced steel office tower and looked at the designs of those uh, buildings under code prescribed forces, uh, and then under the, the, the first version of our uh, design procedures, and then we tightened some things up and tried again. And we ran those through um, a, uh, the, what we call the ATC 58 methodology to calculate the, the losses, and found that there, there were reduced losses associated with the performance-based designs. Uh, there were also some increased costs initially uh, because there were uh, some extra demands on reinforcement and wall thickness and so on. Uh, uh, I don't remember the details, but we were able to demonstrate to the sponsor uh, that through this process, uh, you could save a little bit of money on your insurance uh, were you to, uh, if you were required to uh, insure for your annual, annualized losses, you actually uh, saved a little bit of money going through the performance-based procedure. But it wasn't a night and day change. I think the real reason to do this kind of work is because you, you get the right behavior and you, you have better assurance that you've got the, the building design appropri appropriately. Yes. Yes. 
Yeah. Yeah. So, questions on instrumentation for these buildings uh, in um, Los Angeles, uh, and then by default, it turns out uh, Long Beach and San Diego. There's a requirement for an instrumentation program. So, so uh, there's a companion document. I showed the tall buildings guidelines. Uh, there's another document that the LA Tall Buildings uh, Structural Design Council has prepared, very similar, but little tweaks here and there. Uh, and they require that if you're going to use their document, you have to have an instrumentation plan. Uh, and so there's fairly good instrumentation going into many of these buildings. Uh, the Rincon Tower, uh, the one I said is a, a spitting distance to the San Francisco Bay Bridge has instrumentation in it. And I've seen the, some of the records from small earthquakes. Uh, what is unresolved is what, what will happen to those records after an earthquake. Uh, and uh, you know, there's instrumentation programs that have been underway in California for a few decades, uh, but the data really kind of belong to the owner. And so it, it remains to be seen whether we'll get a chance to really look at the data. The hope is that structural engineers involved with the designs will be able to look and that will help them pinpoint uh, whether there were changes in the building and help them figure out whether some repairs are needed. Uh, but I can't wait to see some of the results. And, and I know where to look in each one of these buildings. I know where the hot spots were. So. So, yeah, so, so in the, uh, these tall buildings guidelines, there's no explicit calculation of collapse. It's very tough to calculate that. And so uh, what we do is you know, we've got the limit of the uh, mean drift is 3% under MCE loading. Uh, the maximum drift that any one record can push a building to is 4.5%. And the, the view is that at that large a drift level, we don't really know whether our analysis record, uh, methods are, are good enough. And so we deem that to be essentially a collapse. We call it a collapse. Um, there is in the US this sense that, well, under MCE shaking, uh, it's acceptable uh, that no more than 10% of the structure subjected to that motion collapse. Uh, and uh, that is kind of adopted into the TBI guidelines in that one out of the 11 records can go beyond the 4.5% or even uh, just not converge. Uh, but if you have two, it, it doesn't count. I've never seen even one not converge. I've seen uh, in one building in San Francisco, I saw them have trouble getting it down to one record going over 4.5%. And, and boy, did they work hard to try to get that one down. Uh, but um, bear in mind that the 10% rule on MCE shaking doesn't mean, oh, in some big earthquake, 10% of the buildings come down. It's 10% it's given MCE shaking. And I, I think uh, the, the truth is that far fewer than that are really going to be vulnerable to, to that. But we don't explicitly calculate it. I, well, so w one of the reasons that it's not included is that uh, some of the very strong proponents of these methods have argued that you can get almost any answer you want once you start playing with the soil springs and how much mass you include down below and is the, uh, the building mass in the subterranean levels being resisted by the core or by the basement walls and the soil, and you can get pretty much any answer you want. And so we've been convinced that because the effects aren't huge, uh, and they're probably mostly conservative uh, to assume the rigid base, that that's what we accept. Um, the one case I mentioned when uh, soil flexibility has to be included is when you've got uh, two different wall systems coming down. and. There, they may have an imbalance in how rigid the two foundation elements might be. In that case, you have to include it 
and, and a bounding analysis. Uh, if uh, Jonathan Stewart from UCLA was here, he'd tell you a totally different story. He'd tell you, you've got to include soil foundation structure interaction. But he's not here. <laughs> <laughs> Any last questions? Charles. Charles. Yeah, so, so for these tall buildings, uh, you know, the period you calculate is what you get. And we encourage the, uh, the structural engineers to do their service level analysis using one program, ETABS, usually, or similar, and do their nonlinear analysis using a different program. Unfortunately, I think uh, CSI is, is merging those two. Not a good thing. But to make sure you've got two different packages to check that one of them isn't way off from the other. It gives a little bit of confidence. In, in the design of buildings by the building code procedures, there's a complicated set of requirements. And so uh, there's a, a simple formula that you have to check. And that uh, sets sort of a, a baseline for your period. Uh, when you calculate the, the period, I don't know that anybody uses Rayleigh method anymore, but they'll use a, 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 a linear analysis software of some sort. Uh, and they'll calculate almost always a much longer period. And so the, the, the first period, the formula period out of the code has to be used to set some base shear requirements. Uh, but drift checks can be done with this other period. And so, you know, there's some back and forth. It's, it's, it's messy. And uh, whenever I teach that in the earthquake engineering class, right before class, I have to read it all up again and try to remember the rules associated with that. But, but yeah, we, we do in the prescriptive provisions you know, require the engineer to not stray too far from that nominal period calculation when they set their base shear strength. Well, with that, uh, I'd like uh, to thank Jack again for, for coming here and, uh, and sharing with us about the, the buildings that have been uh, designed in California and the West Coast. And, um, you know, kind of you to share your buildings with us, and we'll share our earthquake with you. Okay, uh, good. So you don't have to have any of your own. Well, thank you very much. <laughs>